Well, hey everybody, Mike Griffith here. Welcome to Friday Night Mike. Sorry for the, uh, a little bit of a delay. I wanted to go at 8.30, but um, I don't know. I, I, I kind of did some pregame. I said, you know what? Let me go through the SEC picks so that at the end of our talk about Georgia and Arkansas, there's not a lot of, let's face it, there's not a lot of drama as far as uh, who's going to win this football game, right? I know people are going, oh my God, he just jinxed us. No, forget the jinx. Uh, George is just that much better than Arkansas. This is an overmatched opponent. So we're all going to like watch this game under the microscope to find out who is Georgia and what is Georgia. And I, I wrote some stories on it today. I don't expect you to, to read everything. Goodness knows I certainly don't read everything. I don't watch everything. There's way too much out there uh, to be watching and reading everything. Um, oh, let me get, uh, uh, I will say this though. I called the offense the kaleidoscope offense. And the reason why I called it the kaleidoscope offense is because at each turn, it's going to look different, right? You've seen a kaleidoscope, you, you twist the thing around, and, and all the colors fall, and, and, the, and the picture looks a little bit different, right? At least I, at least I think that's, that's the kind of kaleidoscope I had when I was a kid. And I think as we view this Georgia offense, it's going to change throughout the year, depending on the personnel, depending on how Munkin calls the plays, the matchups. I mean, I really believe it's going to be that different. Let me tell you how different it's going to be. Kirby Smart was asked about balance. You guys know Kirby's always balanced this and balanced that. And we're always going to be able to run and blah, blah, blah. He said on his radio show, balance doesn't matter as much as long as you're scoring points. I mean, Kirby's just like, throw it out the window. He just wants points. He doesn't care about the style. He doesn't care. And again, sorry, I'm doing a little adjusting here of the set. I'm trying to get everything balanced. Doesn't care you know, balance, how many runs, how many passes, how many... Listen, Kirby Smart wants to win football games, and he, and he wants to win a national championship. And statistics are not going to do that. So, job number one this year is to serve... It's a 10-game SEC schedule. If you can get out of this game tomorrow running 70 snaps and scoring 28 points instead of snapping it 95 times and scoring 50, you're going to go with 70. And, and why is that? Not because you don't want to please the fans and have the window dressing and all the big points. It's because you want your team to get through the year healthy. Now, you want to learn about your team. And certainly, George is going to do enough things where they're going to get an idea. And they practice against each other all the time. It's always a little bit different when you go into that uncontrolled environment. And you see how that other team schemes you up, right? Sam Pittman knows the personnel. And where Sam probably is more adept against Georgia is uh, against the, the Georgia uh, defense. He knows the tendencies a little bit better. And it'll be interesting to see if Sam can pull a rabbit out of his hat and find something to exploit, something he knows about the Georgia defense, uh, a look or an, or an activity that will, will cause Georgia to do something that he can exploit. That's what I want to find out. Kendall Browse is a good coach. Uh, I covered a game. Michigan State played against Baylor in the Cotton Bowl, and Baylor had a 20-point lead going in the fourth quarter. Baylor could not run the football, and when you can't run the football, it's hard to protect the lead because you can't run clock. Um, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I don't think Kendall needs to worry about protecting a lead uh, against Georgia. M maybe maybe 3-0, to zero, but I don't expect Arkansas to get in the end zone. My prediction for this game was 30-3. to three. I feel good about that prediction. Maybe it's 31, maybe it's 34, maybe uh, the field goals instead of touchdowns, maybe I'm giving Arkansas too much credit. I believe this is a game that Georgia will win with explosive plays and smothering defense. I don't expect to see Georgia, I could be wrong again, but I don't expect the, the 11 to 13 play methodical drive. Uh, now it's possible uh, especially if, if this Georgia offensive line is really good and the Arkansas front isn't as salty as maybe you'd expect. I will say this, Arkansas played a lot of guys, a lot of really young players last year. I think they'll be much better than they were last year in their defensive front. But but my scouting report, it tells me that they're going to be very uh, weak on the back end. And I think that one thing that Dwan Mathis can do is throw a deep ball really well. And George Pickens, uh, if you throw it within four feet of him, his catch radius is ridiculous. He's going to bring it in. So we'll find out what their plan is for George Pickens. We'll find out how many deep balls 
Dwan throws. I expect Dwan to throw a lot of short, very short passes into the flats, quick passes, high percentage throws, give the young freshmen some confidence. You know, Dwan hasn't played a game in almost two years. I, I've got a story up on Dog Nation. November 2nd, uh, 2019, is that right? 2018 was Dwan's last game. It's a long time ago. Uh, so Dwan's going to have to get some confidence. I, I think he's going to start. Kirby said earlier in the week that he wasn't sure if JT would be cleared for the game. Well, if you're not sure, you certainly can't prepare with JT. So they had to be preparing for Dwan. It's a process of elimination. It's not like you're going to go, oh, look, JT's cleared. Hey, let's throw this playbook out we've been working on and grab the other one. Th that's part of this, too. They're very different quarterbacks. And I think it's good that George is managing their quarterbacks to their strengths and trying, instead of trying to do the one-size-fit-all. That happened a few years ago with Jake Fromm and another quarterback, who shall not be named. Uh, when, in, when in actuality, they probably should have uh, adjusted the game plan a little bit more to each quarterback's strengths instead of the masquerade that they're the same quarterback and they're on the same playbook. That, that's not what's happening now. So I expect to see some read option. I expect Samir White to have a big day. I think this is a Samir White kind of game. Uh, I would expect Samir to go over 100 yards. Not sure how much of James Cook we'll see um, in terms of, I, I think we'll see him, but I don't know how much they're going to use him. Not sure you need to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, as far as all the different things that James Cook's going to be able to do in this pro-style offense, because I don't know how much of the pro-style you're going to see. I think you're going to see a very reduced playbook. I mean, Kirby mentioned on his radio show the key being execution, right? So I guess what I would tell you is this. Don't rush to any conclusions uh, based on what you see against Arkansas, because I don't necessarily think that's going to be indicative of what you're going to see in the following two and three and four weeks, uh, whether it's Dwan picking up more of the playbook or who knows, Carson Beck may, gets an opportunity and maybe he shines tomorrow, uh, or JT Daniels gets cleared and you go back to, to doing more of the pro style, uh, go a little bit deeper in the playbook where, you're, where you get through your three progressions. But tomorrow, simplified, execute, survive, and move on. That's what Arkansas is about. Kirby said he typically prefers a road game to start the season uh, because it gets everybody focused and locked in, but not with COVID. Uh, COVID uh, doesn't allow him to dress as many guys. He wants to dress as many guys as he can. You guys may know this, but there's a 70-man travel squad. That's why Kirby's always talking about these guys competing to get on the bus. Um, I guess in this, for this time it's getting on the plane, right? Uh, so there's going to be some guys that were left at home. Uh, that's tough. Hey, last year, Dwan Mathis was left at home. Dwan Mathis didn't make a road game. The first time Dwan got to travel with his team uh, was the Sugar Bowl. So, you know, for me, as someone that covered Dwan um, right after he signed uh, 2019, January, being in his home there in Romulus, Michigan, uh, Terrence opening the door, uh, you know, turning on the fireplace, seeing Dwan's trophy wall, seeing the memories, um, you know, that was special, man. And, and it was a, a kid that knew there was an adventure ahead at, at Georgia, didn't know much about Georgia, frankly, just knew that Justin Fields, oh, doggone it, we mentioned him. Uh, everybody always says, don't mention him, sorry. He's a great quarterback, he's going to come up in conversation. Uh, but when Justin decided to go to Ohio State, Dwan decided to flip because Dwan was the Ohio State quarterback. He'd been committed to the Buckeyes for six months and they wanted to keep him. They didn't let him know that they were recruiting Justin. They lied to him. Um, they lied to him and he found out they lied to him. So he flipped to Georgia with, with on, on a leap of faith, right? So you got to give Georgia re recruiters uh, credit. I, I know James Coley and Jim Cheney were both a part of that conversation along with Kirby Smart. So it, it's a storybook thing. May 23rd, the brain surgery. Uh, the recovery from losing, what, 10, 15 pounds in ICU, uh, the, the uh, cranial surgery where they drew, drilled holes in his skull. I mean, Dwan Mathis has metal screws and metal plates in his head, folks. And this kid's going to come out of the tunnel tomorrow. And as a sports writer, that is something that warms my heart. That's a human interest story. And, uh, and it's personal for me because I know Dwan's story. I, I know Dwan's family. I know his background. I know the people that know Dwan. Um, I know how far back it goes. Um, Michigan State had him on their campus when he was in seventh grade seven years ago. I was a Michigan State beat writer. I'd heard about Dwan Mathis. I knew about this big, tall kid with the big arm, and and uh, and now here he is. And so I think everyone is hoping for the best for Dwan. 
Um, the thing I would just say, and it, just because I, I read the social media comments, I don't get caught up in them, but you know, if Dwan has a huge performance, that's great. Um, but th the people that are that are talking about this and that, you know, don't don't put undue expectations and pressure on a redshirt freshman that's never played in a game that didn't get to go through spring drills. That that's not fair to Dwan. Dwan's job tomorrow is to win the game, and, and job number one is, is going to be managing that huddle, getting the snap off on time. Number two is going to be controlling the ball, no turnovers, no interceptions, no fumbles. Um, it's going to be a lot, all right? And we've taken it for granted at Georgia uh, because Jake Fromm just did it so well. You never saw a delay a game. Jake was the ultimate game manager. That's why he got drafted in the NFL. He wasn't the tallest. He wasn't the fastest. He didn't have a strong arm, but he could manage a game. And those are things Georgia fans have become accustomed to. No delay of game penalties, very few broken plays, nobody comes screaming through uh, unblocked because Jake could control. Okay, this is going to be different for all the quarterbacks this year. Dwan Carson and even JT Daniels. It's going to take time for them to get as fluid running the offense. So it's going to look a little different, in my opinion. Uh, I do think you're going to see some explosive plays that you haven't seen, though, and that's exciting. Part of it is Arkansas. It is. Arkansas is probably the worst team in the league. They probably are, uh, you know, but Georgia's got some young guys that would be excited about Jermaine Burton. I want to see what happens. You, you can bet they're going to try to get the young guys involved, get their hands on the ball. They need those young guys ready to contribute in that difficult stretch of Auburn, Tennessee, Alabama, Kentucky. So I expect to see a lot of young guys get the ball. Don't know how much you, you, you got to use George some, right? You got to use George picking some, but you really want to see what Jermaine Burton can do. Uh, Justin Robinson can do. Uh, Marcus Roseme, you want to see what he can do. Uh, who's going to be at tight end, right? Trey McKitty, probably not going to dress. So Darnell Washington, has he done enough to earn the snaps? We know he's talented, but you got to earn your way on the field when you're George at Georgia. We saw that last year. Malik Herring, all right? This year, think about this. This year, the team captains, Malik, Richard, and mm, who's that other one? I should know this. I saw Jeff Centel put a picture up on Twitter. Malik Richard, got to be somebody in offense, right? Can't think, can't think. Um, but last year, Malik goes to Vanderbilt, doesn't even play in the opener, right? So Malik Herring is a guy that's turned it around. I saw he was first team all SEC by the media. I know we talk a lot about Jordan Davis. We talk a lot about Aziz Ajilari, Jermaine Johnson, Nolan Smith. We talk a lot about Monty Rice, Richard LeCount, Eric Stokes. There's a lot of guys we talk about. Haven't heard as many people talking about Malik Herring. Malik is the highest returning graded lineman in the SEC. That's, that's a mouthful. Pro Football Focus said he, he graded out the best of the returning defensive linemen in the league. That doesn't necessarily translate to sacks, but um, it tells you that Malik took care of business. Trayvon Walker, another exciting guy. I could go on and on about this defense. Uh, you know, Felipe Franks, it was interesting. I did a story earlier this week with... Uh, talking to Felipe Franks and Raheem Boyd, uh, the Arkansas running back, considered one of the better running backs in the league. And Ra Raheem Boyd, you know, you got to understand, when you're a running back, you, you better think you're Superman. When you're a running back, you better believe that you're the best player on the field because when you get the ball in your hands, 11 guys are trying to kill you. There was a youthful game that was called Smear the uh, Person, and you didn't want to, you, know, you had better know uh, that, that you can handle getting hit. And you'd better want those people chasing you. And you'd better anticipate and uh, enjoy that contact. So I guess what I'm saying is to be a running back, you got to be a little crazy. And, and you gotta, uh, you got to like contact and you got to have confidence. And Rakeem Boyd is that. He's every bit of that. And my advice would have been let's not put Rakeem Boyd out the week that they play Georgia. Because Rakeem's going to get excited talking about the game. He's going to get fired up. He believes in his offensive line. And he's going to say something that the Georgia defenders are going to hear. And they're going to feed off of. So he said he's looking forward to playing smash mouth football. Said he's looking forward to smashing somebody in the mouth. I mean, I can just see Monty Rice looking at this. You know, Monty gets his look on his face. Like, like, did you really just, did you really just poke Monty Rice? He did talk about 32. I see 32. He does a lot. I see seven. Now he's naming Monty's number. You know, I just, the collision between Monty Rice and Raheem Boyd tomorrow, the first one, uh, the second one and the third one. Here's my question. 
This is what I was told. This is what I was told. I was told that Rakeem Boyd is a guy that, that cannot handle four quarters of physicality. That's what I was told. And he has invited it, talking about smash mouth football. So my first question is, will Rakeem Boyd finish the game? And I'm not saying with a severe injury or anything. I just think, you know, sometimes when it's, you know, 30 to 3 going into the fourth quarter, why would you play Rakeem Boyd? Uh, Arkansas has a very winnable game next week against Mississippi State. A more winnable game than Georgia, certainly. Georgia has a more losable game next week against Auburn. So if you're Sam and Kirby, two old friends, isn't there kind of a handshake wink agreement that if this is a 27 point margin going into the fourth quarter, that, that nobody's going to throw the ball? So that's my second question. You know, Rakeem Boyd finishing. Uh, my second question, what's the over-under for number of passes thrown in the fourth quarter? Four combined for both teams. Now, some people will say, oh, no, I want Georgia to, to throw it and keep, you know. Well, here, again, like I said, incompletion, stop the clock. Uh, if you have a big lead, the only way you're going to lose it is turnovers. Uh I, I'm ready for anything. And now this that's that's old Kirby. That's 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 percentage football. It's not just Kirby. A lot of great coaches, that's what they do. You get up by four score. You know, look, what did Nick Saban gain by running two around with that big lead on Mississippi State last year? How much did how'd that work out for him? So I guess my point is, you know, there is something to be said for being smart when you've got a lead, especially in game one, especially in a 10 game season, especially in a COVID nineteen. I, I say all this because I'm trying to prepare the Georgia fans if they don't get the, the 50 or 60 points that they think they ought to get. Now, they may get it. They may get it. This could be a blowout to, ho to hog heaven. This could be 56-3. to three. The defense might score three touchdowns. Felipe Franks, who was last at Florida, has played Georgia twice. The first time he played Georgia, I think he got sacked like six times. Now, the second time they got sacked once, that was year one of Dan Mullen. But Franks was very careful talking about Georgia. He knows what it feels like to play Georgia. The other Razorback guys, you know, oh, we're going to go out there and we're going to hit and we're going to play for four quarters and we're going to be tough and we're going to be strong. And I'm going, this is not the game to be talking. Georgia is ready to tear into somebody. These guys are sick of hitting each other. Uh, they're, they're, they're tired of, of the legacy of being a team that can't finish. All they can do is play one game at a time. They can't play the SEC championship game tomorrow and show you all that they're going to finish. Uh, all they can do is take it out on Arkansas, and they will. So cause here's, here's the thing that surprises me a little bit about this game. It's not the betting line, which went from 24 to 28, which, by the way, if I say 30 to 3, that, that's an Arkansas cover, right? It started at 24. Um, the thing that surprises me is that the over-under is 53. That seems awful high. Now, what do they know that we don't know? Anytime there's a bet that looks real obvious, I always tell myself, you know what? It looks too easy. It looks too simple. It hasn't moved enough. 30 to 3 seems reasonable to me, but it's going to be 80 degrees. It's going to be sunny. It's going to be really nice football weather. And when that happens, these guys ball out and make plays. So who knows? Maybe it'll be 49 to 10. Maybe Arkansas will, will have a whoops moment. Kirby said that the strongest uh, uh, position group on their team is receivers. Maybe there'll be a whoops moment. You know, Lewisine is making, what, his second start back there in place of J.R. Reed. He handled Baylor just fine. But Sam Pittman knows the Georgia defense well. And I think Sam is going to have a trick up his sleeve. That could be worth seven if Georgia breaks an assignment. They don't typically do that. They don't typically break assignments. Uh, the second half of last season, the last six games, Georgia did not give up a play of longer than 40 yards in the regular season. I think LSU hit one, but... Not sure if Baylor did or not, but in the second half of the regular season, when they were grooving, they, they don't give up big plays. So this is going to be this is going to be really interesting. Uh, let's see, we've talked about Kendall Bryles, we've talked about Dwan Mathis, Barry Odom, the defensive coordinator uh, for Arkansas, former Missouri head coach. I, I think he's a good coach. I think he he's a guy Kirby respects. I know that. Uh, I think he can scheme them up. So that's why I said they're they're expecting. They talked to one of their linebackers who expects Zamir to be a B-gap to B-gap, kind of an up-the-middle runner, and expects James Cook on the perimeter. I almost feel like George is going to try to show you that Zamir White can catch the ball and James Cook can run up the middle. I almost feel like Georgia might do some things 
just to not create tendency in the first game. Because Kevin Steele at Auburn, is the defensive coordinator, is going to be watching this film. And he's one of the best. He's one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. And you know he did a really nice job scheming up LSU last year, if you remember. Um, and really did a nice job against Georgia when you think about it. Blaylock hit that, they, they hit that big play to Blaylock early. But after that, Georgia scored two touchdowns. Really didn't do much, right? So Kevin Steele's going to be watching with intent to, to try to get a read and a feel for Todd Munkin. And I just, I almost wonder if you're Georgia. I don't want to say that you play left-handed, but I wonder if you do some things with your personnel not to tip your hand. That's why I said tomorrow, I, I'm going to really work hard on my, tell myself, don't, don't believe everything you're seeing here. Don't believe everything you're seeing. Things are going to change with personnel packages. Things are going to change if there's a different quarterback under center. Things are going to change based on the matchups and how much offense you think you need to have. You know, Kirby game plans or his offensive coordinators game plan aggressively when he's playing against an offense that he feels a threat to score. Uh, Gus Malzahn is a guy that has Kirby's attention. Gus uh, Kirby has said many times, you know, against Gus Malzahn, you just try to survive the first quarter and figure out what he's doing and adjust, right? So uh, what's the game plan for Arkansas? Um, you know, I think it's going to be uh, condensed. I think the focus is going to be on execution. I think Zamir White is going to have a big game. I think Dwan Mathis is going to have a big game. You know, Dwan is, is really a skilled runner. Uh, he's a tough kid. He's going to be anxious to run the ball and feel the contact. Uh, love the way Dwan runs. Love his feet. Um, you know, dexterity and his ability to throw off the run. I, I feel like Dwan's going to make some real wild plays. I'm just not sure how consistent. You know, again, George has been used to a very consistent model at quarterback. Right, not flashy, but consistent, and I think Dwan is is going to give us some oohs and ahs. I really do. I think he's going to make some big plays. I think you're going to see some explosive plays. I predict two plays, at least two plays over 40 yard touchdowns. I predict a, a broke a big run uh, over 40 yards. Uh, you know, Arkansas is just um, you know they're overmatched, and it, it's going to be tough uh, for Sam Pittman. Let's talk about some of the other games here. Um, oh well, let me go over the injury report first. So. We talked about it earlier, JT Daniel. We don't know if he'll be cleared. I don't think he's going to play. Even if he's cleared, I, I don't think you play him. Now, will Kirby dress him out, stand him on the sideline, and put the headsets on him so he can listen and signal in plays? Maybe, you know, Kirby's going to want him there. Maybe then Arkansas goes, oh, there's JT. Is he going to play? Is he not going to play? Or does he not take JT and let somebody else dress out? My guess is he brings JT so that JT can get on the headsets and get accustomed to hearing Todd Munkin's voice and, and help Dwan along with Carson as those quarterbacks and Stetson Bennett as those quarterbacks confer during the game and learn from one another what each other's seeing. So uh, I don't think he'll play. Kenny McIntosh and Kendall Milton, you didn't hear a lot about them in the fall. That tells me they were probably banged up. I'd heard Milton had a hamstring. Uh, and that was why he missed at least one scrimmage. Um, you know, uh, Del McGee said uh, he's fine now, less we knew. Don't know about Kenny. I guess we'll see. Like I said, I haven't heard much about him. Kenny had had a really good Sugar Bowl week of practice. Thought he was going to play a lot more. Um, and still think he could end up being a breakout guy. Again, remember, folks, 10-game SEC season. That is an eternity. Uh, Trey McKitty, we talked about earlier, the, the tight end transfer from Wake, or excuse me, from Florida State. Arthroscopic knee surgery uh, almost three weeks ago. He's out. Don't know when Trey will be back. I would guess maybe by Tennessee. Um, Keely Ringo, you know, he's out. He's the five-star freshman signee, torn labrum, been out for a while, and Dominic Blaylock. There's going to be more. Now, Kirby's not going to tip his hand. Uh, he hasn't even put out a depth chart. He's not going to tell you who's injured, who's getting on the plane, who's not getting on. You're going to have to wait until game time because uh, Kirby's a competitive guy. Let's talk about some of these other games. I looked at the betting line, um, and, and I'm, not a, I'm not a gambler, right? So I don't, I don't have any money going here. I just I, I do like looking at the line, though and making predictions on who I think will win. I, I used to do that in the Sporting News Magazine and compete with those editors, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Tennessee is minus three at South Carolina, and I, you know, when you, when you look at betting line, the, the thing to remember, you know, is that an odds maker, his, his objective is to try to get people to bet 50 on one side and 50 on the other, okay? So sometimes it's based more on perception than reality. The perception is, that Tennessee has won six games in a row. Uh, I saw Jeremy Pruitt just got a $400,000 raise. 
The perception is that South Carolina finished last year poorly and Will Muschamp is on the hot seat. South Carolina is a home underdog. This tells me that the odds makers believe that, that uh, they've got to make Tennessee the favorite to get people to take South Carolina. I like South Carolina to win this game outright. I don't even think it really would be an upset. Um, and, and it's not because I don't think Tennessee's going to be dangerous, because I do. I just think that South Carolina at home in the opener, I think Will Muschamp, uh, I think his team's going to be coached up. I know they lost a lot. Um, I know they've got a difficult schedule. But I just have a – I could be completely wrong on this. You know, South Carolina's won three out of the last four. They'd won three straight against Tennessee before last year. Um, I'm going with South Carolina. Home underdog in the SEC, man, that's just – it's too attractive. Uh, Alabama minus 29 at Missouri. If you're asking me if I'm going to take Missouri in 29 um, – Probably not, probably not, because Alabama's got two quarterbacks competing, and 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 I don't think they're going to take their foot off the gas there. They don't have the championship defense that Georgia does, and so I think Saban, uh, you know, I look at Najee Harris. I think he's the best back in the league. Uh, they've got two great running, two great receivers there. They've got two great quarterbacks competing. The, the guy that followed, uh, the guy that followed uh, J T. Daniels at modern day, uh, Bryce Young. He's he's competing. I think Alabama's going to just roast Missouri. Uh, now, I've heard good things about Eli Drinkowitz as a coach, but I don't know. I guess I just need to see it. This this game just looks like something like 56 to 13 or something like that. I just feel like Alabama's so explosive. Uh, so I guess I, it, I would begrudgingly leave, lay the line at 29. I think it opened at 28. I would have felt better about that. 29 is kind of, like I said, I, I don't, I'm not a better. I'm not advocating anybody bet on this so this is for entertainment purposes only uh florida minus 12 at old miss I, I know the trask and the gators you know they're going to be anxious to make a statement you know old miss though and lane kiffin i'll say this i think he gets his guys up to play um i know they're down on players uh i really really want to take 12 points in old miss i really really do i i just you know they're they're wearing those cool light blue uniforms i don't know if you saw those ice uniforms old miss is breaking out I really want to pick Old Miss, but I just I just can't. Twelve points is too tough. I could see Mullen like scoring late in the game to win by fourteen or seventeen or something. Um, okay, uh, what do we got? LSU minus sixteen and a half at home to Mississippi State. You know, I, are, are we bought in on Mike Leach? I know a lot of people either really like Mike Leach or people really don't. I've kind of gone back and forth on this. Uh, I think in my picks with Brandon earlier this week, I took Mississippi State. But LSU at home, I you know what I, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay the points in LSU. I'm gonna I'm gonna flip. I'm gonna do a flip here, a last minute flip. I'm gonna flip to LSU at home. I, I I just don't have a feel for Mike Leach at Mississippi State. Does he command the respect of the players? Do they want to play for him? Are they confident? You look at the last games with Mississippi State and LSU, and LSU has really owned them. Um, I just I just think that there's some psychological. Uh, advantage to having uh, whooped them like that in past meetings. I mean, LSU has really done that. AM minus 29 against uh, Vanderbilt at home. You know, I said this on Feinbaum's show yesterday, and, and Paul started laughing, and I was serious. I'm not sure Vanderbilt's going to finish the season. I'm really not. You know, Vanderbilt's had a lot of guys that have opted out, and, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just not convinced that they're going to finish the season. You know, let me, uh, before I take comments and questions, and, and there's there's the Auburn-Kentucky game I'm going to pick, I need to do a share on this. If you guys would if you guys would help me with a share, I would sure appreciate it. Um, I've always got to share this. It's important. You know, Friday Night Mike, uh, a lot of people have been watching. We, you know, we've done this all summer. You know, we did this before we even knew there would be a season. You know, we were on here talking to one another and visiting and, you know, just kind of trying. Well, look at this. You guys have already shared it 15 times. Thank you. That's that's awesome, man. I really appreciate that. Um, I was asleep at the wheel, and you guys took care of business there. Um, we didn't know there would be a season. Um, and we talked about it all summer. There were hundreds of us on here. I, I, I know you, you all know who you are. Um, the conversations that we had before we knew that, that the SEC would press forward, um, I, th I thought it was very healthy. I thought that 
you know, having this group to talk to on Friday nights made my week go by faster. It was something that I, I look forward to. I still look forward to. It's a, it's a conversation. It's not really a show. It's a conversation. You guys have a great conversation and, and running discourse uh, while we're doing it. Um, like I said, it's just it gives me a lot to think about, and it gives me a lot to be thankful for that, that we've got this group in Dog Nation and the fan following that we do. You know, I'm sure most of you watch Brandon Adams. He does Dog Nation daily, every day, weekday at 10 o'clock. Uh, Brandon is at Arkansas. He will be broadcasting from there tomorrow. Uh, really excited for Brandon. Um, that's going to be fun. I'm going to do a halftime show on here. I'm going to do about five-minute wrap. I'm going to give you some quick thoughts on what's going on in that game. I'm going to do a live blog. I hope you guys join me for the live blog. It, it's a login. Uh, I'll be doing updated scoring and commenting. Uh, so I hope that you guys will join me for the live blog. Check that out during the game. And uh, it's just tomorrow is it's going to be a lot of emotion just because of how long we've had to wait. Everything that we've gone through, everything that these players have gone through, to get to this point, you know, I was listening to Monty Rice talk earlier this week, and you know, Monty said that that things got so hard and so difficult in the off season for him that he quit carrying his phone around. I mean, what does that tell you? I mean, you you all know how attached we all are to our phones, right? Can you imagine, you know, if you're a young man and there's just so many things going on in society, so much pressure, so much talk about not playing the game that you love that you just leave your phone and you just can't take it anymore. I'll tell you, there were days that I probably shouldn't have looked at my phone too. Um, but that, again, that's what brings it back to, to the Friday night with you guys. You know, we, we, we have this conversation, we talk football, and, um, and I take your questions. My final pick, Auburn minus seven at home against Kentucky. This is another, you know, you see me wringing my hands like, Ugh, uh, I don't know, I don't know. I don't think Kentucky has a great quarterback, see? Um, I'm going to take Auburn and lay those points. I am. I, I, I've gone back and forth on Auburn, Kentucky, and Mississippi State LSU. I just don't have a good feel. So I'm going to take a look at your questions now and comments and uh, and see what you guys have to say. I really appreciate you joining me tonight. It's been a great show. It's been fun talking to you about the team. Uh, Jerry says, I enjoyed the comments. Does, Jerry, did I miss something here? Did I miss something here? Because Jerry's kind of making it sound like I might have missed something here that maybe if I had read the comments that I wouldn't enjoy the comments? Is that the implication? Uh, okay, sometimes, look at Joel Moody says he didn't pick up his phone after the 2017 National Championship. Man, Joel, I know how you feel. Uh, I understand that. I've covered teams that, you know, when they lost, you know, you, you could feel it in your gut. Uh, you could feel it for the kids. You knew that Georgia team was the best team in the country. You knew that Alabama probably didn't belong in the playoff. They lost by double digits to Auburn and didn't even play in the league title game. They didn't deserve to be there. Were they one of the four best? Yes, but they really didn't deserve to be there. Uh, they had an easier game against Clemson in New Orleans. It was a watered-down Clemson team. I was down there for that, uh, covering Jeremy Pruitt right before he became the Tennessee coach. Clemson was a very poor team, uh, and, and Georgia had a shootout with Baker Mayfield that had to be exhausting and emotional. It's really unfortunate that Georgia didn't win the 2017 national title because Georgia was the best team in college football. But but sometimes, sometimes the best team doesn't win, right? And also, it's when you play teams. For example, and I know Clemson fans always get mad at me when I say this, but you know when Trevor Lawrence and, and Clemson beat Alabama two years ago, Clemson was not the best team in the nation in September or October. They were barely getting by Syracuse, right? They were barely getting by A&M. But they got better, right? And now college football has become a playoff sport with four teams. And so, uh, you know, if you get... And that's... I'm a little worried. I'm a little bit worried that college football is going to go to an eight-game playoff. I'm a little bit worried about that. I don't think that college football should go to an eight-game playoff. I do understand that people want to see it. I do understand it would involve more teams, but it would penalize the SEC for playing a 10-game schedule, whereas the Big Ten's only playing eight, and now the Pac-10's saying they're going to start like November 6th, but they want to be eligible, or Pac-12. I mean, you know, if the Pac-12 plays a six-game schedule and gets somebody in there, and the SEC plays a 10-game schedule, well, 
Duh, of course the Pac-12 guys are going to be healthier and have less attrition. So I got a problem with that. I think we need to keep it with four. And really, you know, the fact that the Big Ten's only playing eight games, I think that's a big advantage for Ohio State, especially when you realize that Ohio State plays, uh, you know, two of their tougher games on the front end. Um, you know, I, I really expect to see Ohio State in the playoff. And, and, and right now they probably wouldn't be a bad pick to win the national championship because of the SEC's 10-game schedule, because the Big Ten is only playing eight games. That's a big advantage. And if you have four to six guys healthier than that SEC team, that, that, can, that, can, that could be enough. Um, so, again, I'm not picking Ohio State to win a title. I just I can't do it. It's not in me. I, I've seen Ohio State falter. When I covered Michigan State, I watched Michigan State with far less talent beat Ohio State and Urban Meyer two out of three years, win the Big Ten title. Should have never happened. I saw, I saw Michigan State beat Ohio State when Ohio State had Ezekiel Elliott and Michael Thomas, and they shut them down. Shut them down in Columbus. Um, Ohio State, to me, a um, lot of talent, big school, but there's just something about Ohio State I just I, I can't get into. You know, I never have. You know, maybe because I grew up in Michigan. Maybe that's it, right? Growing up in Michigan, there's a rivalry with Ohio. I've just never had a lot of respect for Ohio State. I mean, I, I do and I don't. I have respect for them, but only so far up until they hit that SEC team, right? I know they beat Bama that one year, but you go back and look at Ohio State in bowl games against the SEC, I want to say they're like 2-8 and eight or something, right? Everybody beat Ohio State in bowl games for a long time. Um, not, that doesn't mean anything about now. Speaking of now, I, I thought it was pretty funny. Kirby was asked about the uniforms, and I'll write about this in the morning. And he explained uh, one of the things that I thought was funny, um, funny, not funny, so they, they showed those uniforms, right? They did the uniform reveal, the red and white and the black. And did, I don't know, did any of you wonder, you know, why didn't they just run out in them? Why didn't they just surprise everybody, right? I mean, that's what a lot of teams do. Why don't you just surprise everybody? And Kirby said he wanted to get the uniform message out so that the players wouldn't be thinking about it. He said, because if the guys are thinking too much about the uniforms, they're not thinking about what they've got to do to beat the other team. So he wanted to get that out of the way. He doesn't believe uniforms make guys play any harder. He says 100% is 100%. Um, but he does like the uniforms, and that's why he announced them in advance. I think that was Kirby going, all right, I'm going to do this. But if we're going to do it, we're going to do it my way. And my way is to announce these uniforms a week in advance. So these kids ain't going to be getting too excited on game day. They can be focused on the game plan. Cause, you know, And the other team, they're not going to get jacked up or a boost of adrenaline because George is wearing surprise uniforms. Everybody knows what George is wearing. Everybody knows why they're wearing them to celebrate the 1980 National Championship team and, and uh, of course, the great Herschel Walker team and, you know, obviously maybe, maybe the greatest college football player ever. Uh, Herschel is, is a gentleman, a prince of a guy. I had an opportunity in January. Uh, he was at the uh, Football Writers Breakfast. I had an opportunity to honor him as the first ever uh, freshman legend. Every year, the Football Writers Organization uh, recognizes the freshman of the year, and they will now recognize a freshman legend. And Herschel Walker's 1980 freshman year had to be the first one. Uh, I told Sean Alexander, I worked with Sean on this award. Sean is the, the namesake for the freshman of the year. I said, Sean, it's got to be Herschel. we got to get Herschel to New Orleans. Uh, this is the site of where Herschel did his magic against Notre Dame. He's the best college football player in history. It's got to be Herschel Walker. And uh, he, him and his wife, it couldn't have been more pleasant, polite, professional, uh, tremendous ambassadors for the University of Georgia. And uh, really enjoyed uh, having that morning uh, breakfast uh, uh, ceremony with Herschel Walker. Pretty cool. There was a lot of other stuff going on. Herschel didn't speak. He was just honored. Um, and he was cool with that. He's just like, hey, let's do it. You know, you know, all the sports writers in the room were coming up and shaking. It, like, it takes a lot to get national media to come over and shake a hand and get a picture taken. But everybody wanted the picture taken with her. I got my picture taken with Herschel Walker. I don't get my picture taken with athletes. But Herschel Walker, you know, we're talking about the greatest college football player ever. And he's not an active player, right? So, you know, rule number one, you know, if you're a journalist, you, you never get autographs, completely unprofessional. Um, 
and, and you know, you, you don't get tickets either because everybody meets you. Oh, you're Mike Griffey, you cover team. Hey, how about some tickets? Yeah, we don't get tickets. Nobody gives sports. They don't need to give us tickets. They don't want to give us tickets. Uh, uh, but, but Herschel being a legend, you know, and I spent some time again on the SEC Network talking about him. And, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, something needs to be done on campus for Herschel Walker before too much longer at Georgia. That's, that's my opinion. What else you guys got for me tonight? Um, I wrote a story about Dewan's last high school game. It was cold. It was windy. He didn't do real well. His teammates didn't do real well. It's going to be 80. It's going to be sunny. He's got a great team around him. Uh, just can't wait. Uh, let's see. What do we got here? Jacob O'Neill. We're not talking about football in here? Well, Herschel Walker's kind of football. Um, uh, John Adams wants to know, don't know when George is wearing black. Uh, you, black jerseys. You know what? I wondered that too because I'd heard rumor that Auburn would be one game and then there would be a game later in the season. I, I don't know. Uh, what games would you want? There's only four home games, right? Um, so maybe against Tennessee? Uh, Auburn, Tennessee at home. And then what? Mississippi State and Vanderbilt? Maybe you wear, I don't know. Who, who else do you wear them against? I. No, there's only four home games. Well, you know, you are the designated home team for Florida. Could we see Could we see black jerseys at Florida in Jacksonville? And now that's a home game. It's 340 miles away, but that is a home game technically. Um, so, I don't know. Let's wait and see. Uh, Shelton Tucker says, Short Street Walker used to eat free at my aunt's restaurant. I... I bet he probably ate free just about everywhere. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to be honest about it, I mean, who's going to charge? You know, not. But you know, Herschel is a valedictorian of his high school too. I mean, he's, the, he's a really like I. You know, you guys get me talking about Herschel Walker, and um, you know, he's a great player. What can I say? Enjoyed watching him play as a kid. Uh, Ten years since the last game, Stephen Carr. I think we're all feeling that right now. I think we're all ready. And, and I said this last week that I felt a little guilty because I really haven't watched much high or much college football or NFL. It it just it hasn't felt like football season, and because um, the SEC is not playing. And, and there's a part of me, you know, with with not being at the games this year. And I'm I'm a guy I love the travel. Right, that's why I'm a sports writer. Love getting on the Delta flight checking into the Marriott Hotel or the Courtyard or the Spring Hill Suites or the Fairfield Inn, going down to the uh, lobby area, eating the uh, oatmeal, uh, chopping up a banana in it, maybe some yogurt, a hot cup of green tea, opening my laptop and writing a story. Uh, finding the local Panera Bread for lunch, uh, trying to find out if there's a good Mexican restaurant to eat at the night before. Uh, going for a walk the next morning, reading the local newspaper, uh, driving through the stadium traffic and finding the media lot, hoping that it's not a mile away, knowing that it probably is. Uh, going to the press box elevator, getting up there early, seeing friends I haven't seen in years, seeing the view, finding my seat, um, leaving my notebook up there, going down on the field, watching the position gro groups go through warm-ups marveling at the speed and the power, uh, the talent that George's got out there, looking at the other team, eyeing them up, what guys jump out at you athletically. Uh, are there any VIPs? Is Peyton Manning there? Is, is Herschel there? Uh, can I maybe flag down Todd Blackledge for an interview uh, or David Pollock or Kirk Herbstreet? Uh, you know, game day uh, for a sports writer is just absolute heaven. Now, the game starts and it's all work. It's all work. And it, it never stops, and the game's over, and, and you all go to uh, to restaurants and bars and talk with friends, and you know I don't you know we stay six hours after the game in the press box and and don't sleep because you got to write all these stories for the next day. But that's the passion, right? It's a labor of love, and you want to write about this and you want to write about that, and going down for interviews and interviewing this player and pulling the guy aside after you stop and saying, hey, you know, did this really, you know, what really happened, you know, and getting that extra little bit, asking Kirby that press conference question knowing he might shoot back at you Kirby you know last year I said Kirby or two years ago why why'd you do that extra field goal against Auburn well why not well because you had a comfortable lead well what's comfortable and then he did some math seven plus three equals ten I don't know what it meant but I guess it made sense in the Kirby mind you know that exchange right going back listening to the tape the, looking at the other team what did the other team's coach have to say you know did they pick up some tendency about Georgia that we don't know 
Did somebody say something inflammatory? Did Dan Mullen say that, that they really only lost by seven and it really was closer than you thought? Is somebody going to say something stupid that you're going to go, holy cow, can you believe that they just said this? So, you know, as a journalist, I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss that. Um, but it's a COVID-19 year. Uh, we're all a little inconvenienced. Uh, you know, li credentials are limited. Uh, best for our team, for me to be right here uh, doing it from home base, catching everything on the tube. Writing, a, writing stories during the game, doing a live halftime report. Brandon will do a post-game show from Fayetteville. That's going to be exciting. And then uh, Connor Riley and myself, we're going to have a ton, a ton of coverage uh, on Dog Nation. So I'm really, really excited about all this. You can tell I've been waiting. We've been planning. And uh, we've just got so many cool things in store for you. Shelton Tucker's no Georgia Tech. Nobody cares about Georgia. Does anybody care about Georgia Tech anymore? So, I, I've got I've got uh, uh, a kid I covered at Tennessee on that team, Ryan Johnson. He's a heck of a player, heck of a transfer. Great parents I stay in touch with. They're really pleased with the way Georgia Tech is treating their kid, and very impressed with the operation. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, Georgia Tech. You know, I, that's why I don't think Georgia needs to be going home and home with them. If they get good enough, they'll start getting players that Georgia wants. If they take one or two, it's one or two too many, or three or four, it's three or four too many. Um, just kind of some thoughts on that too. Other questions you guys have for me here. Looking here, uh, John Adams, you have Florida being favored over Joe. You know, the, the Florida pick in the media, I saw that and I was a little surprised. I, I think there's a little Georgia fatigue out there. I do. And, and I think when you say good defense, I just don't think that really resonates. I just don't think people really know. When we say good defense, what we really mean is maybe the best defense Georgia's ever had. And I, and I still don't think that resonates. Because, you know, it's an offensive world, right? Especially after what LSU did last year. Everybody thinks offense is the way to do it. I just wonder, you know, the way the, the offseason with the incongruent uh, offseason, the lack of training, I almost, I wonder if the, this is a year where a great defense can win it. Because everybody's offense is a little behind the eight ball without spring drills. You know, they, they don't have the same choreography, the same continuity that maybe they would have of a typical offseason. It's also a 10-game season. You wonder how many players are going to be lost to injuries. We're starting to see more injuries. I got a theory about that too. You know, you're seeing all these knees in, in the NFL. My thought is you're seeing less concussions. Now players are attacking the body more. They're hitting lower. They're striking lower. Uh, I'm wondering if that's leading to, you know, where's the upper body blow, right? Helmet to helmet. Now they're going lower. I wonder if that's what's leading to more uh, lower leg injuries, lower body injuries, hip injuries. Players are tackling lower because of the helmet to helmet rule. Uh, it's, it's a violent game. There's going to be injuries uh, no matter what. Um, but it's just where do you get the injuries? It seems like this year there's a lot of, a lot of ligaments and, and bones as opposed to concussions. Uh, you know, Tony Jackson's on board with me. The D really isn't respected. Only two, two guys, Jordan Davis and Richard LeCount, were the only two that made preseason All-SEC, according to the coaches. The media added Malik Herring on there. I, I just don't think they know... Um, Someone's asking John Green, why does the everyday beat writer uh, not able to go? Well, they're going to be doing social distancing in the press box. And uh, I, I told my boss, BJ Sweeney, you know, I said, you know what, this year, I, I think I think that I, it would be better for the team for me to stay home because uh, you're not going to get to go do interviews there. All the post-game interviews are going to be done on Zoom. So they're not going to let the media go on the field. So that, that walk around the field where I could look at players and talk to people, I can't do that now. That post-game interview session, I can't do that either. You got to put on a mask and go to the press box and, and wear your mask the entire game sitting in the press box. And you really aren't supposed to get up, move around in the press box. And then you can't do interviews afterwards. So I get the same access on this. I'm on the same Zoom call after the game as the people that are there. So why do you go to the game if you're not going to have a chance to talk to the players and the coach in person or go on the field? Uh, well, Brandon's going to capture the environment, and Brandon does his post-game shows there. It makes perfect sense for him, um, you know, because he used to, you know, he does his post-game show at Georgia at the bookstore across the street anyway. So he wants to go on the road. He'll see the Georgia fans. He's very interactive in the fan base. You know, I, I really, I'm really not. I'm, I'm in the box, and I'm doing interviews the whole time. So, you know, that being the case, it just made sense. But they are going to uh, distance people out in the box six, six feet. So most, most games, the different uh, organizations will only have one guy there. And, and that was just a Dog Nation plan, and, and I'm, I'm good with it. You know, I mean, I'm as good with it as I can be. I didn't want 
to make that decision, but I knew it was best. And you know, it's gonna tear my heart out tomorrow, folks. I'm gonna tell you, when I'm sitting inside alone watching the big screen and, and there's no band and there's no, you know, I'm gonna miss that environment. I'm gonna miss it. I've done it for my whole career. It's it's my livelihood, but this is a this is a one off. We're gonna do what we gotta do uh, to serve our readers best. And that's what I'm here for on Friday night, right? Um, what do we got here? Uh, Jerry Swafford, put the sanitizer down. I still got sanitizer in my car. I'm still masking up. I want to get through this, man. I want to get, I feel like we're getting close. Science is moving forward. The rapid testing. We're getting there, folks. We're getting there. Uh, someone said, uh, Marshall says they're suited to run a 4-3 this year. Um, you know, that 3-4, three, 4-3, four, four, three, Kirby can run a 3-4 and it looks like a 4-3 because he's got Aziz on the line or Jermaine Johnson on the line. Uh, I wonder if you might see some more 4-2-5. To me, I feel like 4-2-5 is kind of the base alignment that you usually see with that star out there with Mark Webb or Tyreek Stevenson. Really depends on what the offensive formation is doing, how many receivers they have. On defense, you're going to mirror that with defensive backs and you're going to go to your nickel or your dime. Um, I, I think 4-2-5 was actually the formation that, that Georgia had the most snaps in last year. But so much of this is going to be dictated by what the offense is doing. So uh, we're going to have to see. Yeah, the Spike Squad, going to miss them. Uh, Rodney White, I'm with you. I think Richard LeCount is going to have a huge game tomorrow. I, I do think this, though. Sam Pittman's not stupid, and Sam is Sam knows the personnel too well. Um, Felipe Franks is not going to be throwing downfield, okay? It, there could be some forced fumbles, but if there's more than one one interception, I would be very surprised. I think you're going to see very safe routes, very short passes underneath. Throw a quick pass, try to beat or shake a, the Georgia DB, make something happen, uh, run the ball, keep the clock moving. I, I just feel like Sam knows what he's doing against Georgia. Um, so it's going to be interesting, but I, again, I, I feel like it, it, I feel like this is going to be a 30-3 to 3 game. Folks, I'll tell you what. We've gone, oh my gosh, we've gone over 15 minutes. This is great. Um, Mike Sampisi wants a 4-2-5 receiver. You might have one in Arian Smith. I've heard Arian Smith's a flyer. Uh, so, Zamir White, my predictions for tomorrow. Uh, Dwan Mathis, I'm going to write this out. And I know you guys will hold me to it. Uh, Dwan Mathis, I'm going to say Dwan is going to be 12 of 18 passing for 185 yards and two touchdowns. And I think he'll come out of the game in the third quarter with George up big, and I think Carson Beck's going to come in, and I think Carson Beck is going to go 4-7 for 90 yards and two touchdowns. That's what he's going to go. My, my score, and then I'm going to give him a safety. That's going to be 30. How about that? Four touchdowns and a safety, 30-3. to three. Uh, I'm going to say Zamir White goes for 150 yards. Uh, I'm going to say James Cook gets 50 yards. I'm going to say George Pickens, five catches. No, make it six catches. Six catches, 130 yards leading receiver. Those are my predictions. Uh, I want you guys to give me your predictions now. Uh, I want you guys to give me your predictions on your threads. I want to see Dwan Mathis passing predictions in here right now. And I want to see Zamir White rushing yardage. And I want to see some scores. I want, I want, I want, I want. Uh, Dwan Mathis passing line. Give me your Dwan Mathis passing line in my thread right here because we'll go back and we'll check it. Tell me how many yards Dwan Mathis is going to throw for. Tell me how many yards money, uh, that uh, Zamir White is going to rush for. Tell me how many yards Carson Beck is going to throw for. That's what I want to see in your predictions. Now, I did mine. I'm a writer. I do this all the time. You got, sometimes you're going to be wrong. Sometimes you're going to be wrong. Give me your predictions. Uh, look, we got a bold prediction for three Richard LeCount interceptions. And I see Shelton Tucker uh, all over Carson Beck tonight. That's an, an oh, D J Joe has Dwan rushing for two. To wow, maybe, you know what? Let me adjust this to Dwan Mathis, one passing touchdown, and Dwan Mathis. One rushing touchdown. I like that. I'm going to steal that and make it my own. Uh, Mathis, 170. Zeus, 120. Uh, Chad thinks that they are going to go to James Cook. He's got him with 150 all-purpose. And uh, Leslie Waller thinks the defense is going to get a score. 
Uh, 61 to 0, Shelton Tucker says. Wow, John Green, 275 for Mathis 1. Keep those predictions coming, man. Uh, I always like coming back through here and answering your questions. Give me a follow on Twitter. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Mike Griffith32. If you give me a follow on Twitter, I appreciate it. I'll give you a follow back. It's a good way if you got questions, you can ask me questions on Twitter. I'm looking at that Twitter all the time. I'm putting stories up. I've got a story up right now about Dwan Mathis' last high school game. You can see what happened there. There's video of that. Uh, the last time Dwan played a high school football game in Michigan was November 2nd, 2018. It was very cold. And uh, you'll see though how Dwan moves around, and you'll get kind of an idea of what to expect tomorrow from him when you see him scramble. I mean, he really... He's so light on his feet. It's just amazing. The footwork he has uh, just blows me away. You're going to want to read that Dwan Mathis story. And then I'll have that Kirby Smart story in the morning. Kirby's talking about the uniforms, his thoughts on that. Also talked to uh, uh, Vince Dooley about the uniforms and Ray Goff, uh, Jim Donnan as well. So you'll want to read what those coaches had to say about those alternate uniforms. I think I'm going to break that story out in the morning. I've kind of been sitting on that one. Uh, had it all week, and I, well, when's the right time to write about it? I said, oh, let's do it on game day. Let's let the coaches talk on game day. Listen, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for sharing this. The more people that see it, you know, the longer we can do it. And, uh, you know, it was it was good. Uh, you know, we, we've got we've got a new Mason here, and uh, it, it was good to have him here by my side. Uh, he's a little different. Um, you know, he's a little bit different than the first Mason, but, but – uh, you know, he's there. You know, the Bulldog is back. The Bulldog is back. The Bulldogs are back. It's football season, everybody. So I want you to enjoy it. Uh, be safe this weekend. I'm getting ready to turn the camera off. I always get excited. Be safe this weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Um, and I will be back Monday with Josh Brooks. He's the deputy AD at Georgia. And he's going to tell you about the tailgating and the rules at the stadium next week. So you're going to want to see Josh Brooks, and I'll have an Auburn guest on as well on Monday night. But tomorrow, halftime right here. I'll be on at halftime. Join me. Brandon Adams in the post game, and then uh, we'll have Dog Nation Daily at 10 a.m. Monday, and I will be on Monday night with Ingles on the Beat. Everybody, have a wonderful weekend.